like Tyrone mentioned, I was born in Springfield, then I live in Roxbury, which is outside of Boston for a certain time. A lot of West Indian population, black. So in school, you would assume that I had a lot of black male teachers. My first black male teacher was actually at Georgetown named Professor Williams. So my entire K-12 experience, I did not have not one black male teacher. The closest thing I had was what they used to have called teacher assistants, y'all remember that? Which are now called paraeducators. And Mr. Um, what's his name? He was funny. Um, Mr. Wallace, he used to call me Greasy Head. Um, and because they used to put so much gel in my head and he used to make, make me laugh all the time. But Mr. Wallace, for me, was my teacher to me. Because when I was acting up, he used to put Anthony around. Because I was in first grade, they put me in special ed because they said I was acting out. They said that something was wrong with me. And so you know how the special ed track begins. So from first grade to second grade, I was in special ed classes, self-contained. When I took the testing, I don't know if y'all remember the Iowa testing and all that, I was reading on a seventh grade level in first grade. So they said, this can't be academic. So it has to be something else. And reality was, I was bored. They were talking to me, I already knew my numbers. Um, so for me, I had to find, my mom had to learn, and my, mind you, my mom is Haitian, so she had to have a language barrier on top of that to interpret reasons why I should leave a special ed. And it was a two year process to get me out of special ed. When I went to third grade, I was finally out of special ed classes. Mr. Gula, white teacher, I spent the entire third grade in Mr. Principal Lepan's office. He said I was disrespectful because a lot of times he would teach something and I would say, I don't think that's correct, sir. Um, I think the answer is this. So he thought I was being disrespectful, but in reality I was correcting his math in class and so he didn't like that. So I spent a whole you know, experience. Fast forward to high school, they had a junior assembly. I don't know if y'all remember those where they talk about college and career. I had Ms. Noter, and she's still here today. I want to tell her something. She calls all through the class and said, hey, a lot of y'all trying to apply for these schools, but y'all should go to a community college or a state school because y'all know where y'all coming from. They're not going to see y'all as valuable students because y'all come from a hood school, as she called it. I said, you know what? Let me prove her wrong. I applied, 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 ended up at Georgetown, full scholarship. Um, the following year, and it taught me one thing. Had I been somebody else who didn't have a strong mother, I probably would have said, you're right, and not go to college. But I taught myself, back to Mr. Wallace, the teacher assistant, that he believed in me in second grade and third grade because he inspired me to be better than what I was. So a lot of us have scenarios where we can relate to that part. Um, so we can get to the presentation. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about why this matters today in 2018. Do we have the clicker or if not, that's okay. All right, so I'm glad that um, Tyrone um, had y'all think about that. So I really want to hear for some of you in the room, um, how many of y'all have had one black male teacher in your K-12 experience? Raise your hands. K-12, any, any time, just one. I'll put your hands down. How many of y'all have had two black male teachers? Okay. Three, four, five. Angel, I want to be at your school because you got a lot. Uh, six, seven. Anybody more than that? Okay. Brother Jamal, how many of you had? Most of my teachers was black until high school. Mm. I went to Harlem Park in Lamel. Can y'all hear him? Yeah. I went to Harlem Park in Lamel, so most of my teachers was black. I didn't have a diverse until I went to Maribel. Mm. So, I mean, that's how it was. But isn't that interesting that as the numbers went up, the hands went down? And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and reality is, and I'll talk about this a little more, so I'm going to not go ahead of myself. So you can go to the next slide. So what do we know? Research shows right now only 2% of the teaching force is black male educators in America. We know that education is a uh, female dominated um, role, so 77% of women are educators. Out of those, 23% are men. Out of 23%, only 2% nationwide are black male educators. 
So think about that. Next slide. Another part of the graph is that between 2008 when Obama was elected and his second term, 2012, the number of black educators decreased. The only other group that had a worse experience was Native American teachers. So we actually have had a decline in black male educators in the country nationwide um, under Obama's administration. I'm not saying that's his fault, but I want you to put that in perspective that we had a black president, the number of black male educators decreased. Next one. Historical note, in 1954, there were 82,000 black teachers in American public schools. 10 years later, after Brown versus Board of Education, nearly 40,000 black teachers, that's half, in principle lost their jobs when they closed a lot of black owned schools. So remember, before 1954, the Board of Brown versus Board of Education, we had a lot of black teachers and principals. After Brown versus Board, we lost half of our teaching force because what did they do? They closed down black schools and then they did quote unquote integration and then we saw what happens now. So think, that about, think about that a little bit. Next one, please. And of course, what do we teach? Most, I wish I had a click uh, pointer, but most of us teach, and it's not are in either public schools, urban schools, or high minority schools. You'll find a lot of black teachers, just like the brother over there mentioned, you're gonna see them at the Booker T's, the Harlem, the uh, Renaissance Academies, you're gonna see Douglas High School because those are the most high minority student population as well as the most impoverished neighborhood as well. By the way, pay is actually less in our urban schools than in our suburban schools in some calculations. So let's open it up. Why do you think, after hearing this part of the presentation so far, black teachers are leaving the profession, particularly black male teachers? Sister, right here. Um, well, you mentioned those schools, which two of them I worked at, Renaissance and about to be a book of tea. And one of the issues is that that actually is the reason that they put black teachers at the most lowest performing, high stress schools and we get burned out um, because we don't have the luxury of teaching at schools like City, Poly, Western. You know, we end up at the schools with the lowest um, performance students, the lowest attendance, the worst administration, and then we dip because it's too much. And then the brother right here, and then we'll go to the back. Um, my father, may he rest in peace, taught in Baltimore City Public Schools for over 25 years. Wow. My mother did not have a degree. My father did. My mother made more than my father. Mm. It's very difficult for a black man to lead a household in this city, or in the country for that matter, and make less money than his spouse. Right. And he has a degree. His spouse does not. When you have children, it's very difficult. We were by no means rich. Right. We got by, we paid bills, but my father made less money than my mother with that degree. Mm. That is in large measure why many black men cannot and will not look on a career as a city public school teacher when you have bills to pay and mouths to feed and you're getting paid less money. Right. It's not an option. Very seldom is it, if it is, at all. Absolutely, thank you. And then we had a sister back there. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I found in regards to why there are very few um, small percentage of African-American men in the education system, especially K-12, uh, you see as a threat. Mm. Seen as um, either a threat violently or a threat as far as socially, sexually, pedophilia in that aspect, you are viewed as a threat. Um, because I, I know that, you know, African-American people, or all, not just men, women as well, are hypersexualized, uh, especially as far as dealing with um, predominantly white society, we are all hypersexualized, therefore seen as a threat or a danger to virtue and things of that nature, what is society is deemed as virtue, uh, we are um, considered potential desecrators of that. So therefore, um, to have a black male presence 
um, to quote unquote maintain that virtuous charge, uh, you're highly doubted in being able to do so. Thank you. We had a brother thing in the green shirt. Yes, thanks for what you all have to say. Um, looking at, when I started going back to school with teaching and taking out student loans and buying books and things like that, and one particular day I called them and they were like, well, Mr. Bradley, you need to start paying back on your loan. And I haven't graduated yet. Well, how much are the payments? $800 a month. Mm -hmm. I'm a black male and I'm still a substitute teacher and I don't believe I'm getting a degree in teaching. The stress that we go through and the monthly payments on paying back a loan, mm -hmm. you know, too much money. So thank God for that forgiveness program <laughs> because that's about where my rent is. So it, it's about that. Um, the threat thing, I think it's about the influence on our black males. And the society is saying we really don't want you to have an influence positive male influence on our black That's right. So stay in your place. Right. We'll take one more if anybody has one more comment. Okay. But yeah, um, I see the threat a little bit because, um, but I see it a different way. It's, it's what you're saying, influence. They're afraid that us in a, in, big, big, in a school will influence our black young people and change their mind and when they start seeing themselves differently in a positive light. I think that's the biggest threat to see. Also, notice in schools that the black male who's really good ends up being the dean of discipline. So we become adversarial when we have to handle all discipline stuff. That happened to me my second year teaching. They said, oh, I want you to be the dean of students because the kids all love your class. I said, no, I want to stay in the classroom because I want it. that's the most influential. They end up finding a way to cut me and then promote me so I can still take the job. But I learned that, you know what, no matter what happens, I'm gonna still teach them like if they're my students in my classroom. So I, that's why I started my mentoring program, because I realized if they're gonna cut me one way, I gotta find another way to teach our young people regardless of what they say we have to do. But yes, a lot of y'all have spot on. So research shows that a lot of young people, I mean a lot of black teachers, particularly males, leave because of administration. And we know that. As, as your brother said right here, as you go into high school, a lot of the leadership becomes more white and, and becomes very adversarial with um, black male teachers. Testing, everything is about testing, testing, testing. When do we teach? Okay? You can, you can count March to June to be a pointless time of the year because you're not learning. Your students are always taking a test. Um, another one I want to point out is poor salary benefits. Almost 40% of people say money ain't right sometimes, and that's important to know. If you got to pay bills, especially those who have a family, that's an expensive career to have, because you forget education is one of the very few fields where you don't get paid for overtime. Police officers get it, nurses get it, doctors get it, custodians get it, but a teacher who stays past, most teachers stay, work at least I think research says 87 hours a week. They only get paid the annual salary. There's no compensation time, so that's a problem in itself as well, that we have to look at the bigger scale. Um, one thing that I'm gonna research in my doctoral is pay scales. If you think about it, women make less than men nationally. If the field is predominantly women, salaries are lower. So what would happen if we increase the number of males in the education field, you will see the salaries go up to six figures quickly. Yeah. That's something you gotta think about, and I'm gonna research that in my doctoral program. So, what is the country doing? I've been working for the last year with Philly um, schools, and there's a program called the Black Male Educators Conference. I want everybody to research them. They've been doing this work, these young brothers have been doing this work in Philly, where they said, we know it's 2%, but what are we gonna do about it? So they forced the hand of the mayor, um, Jim Kenney, in Philly, who's a white mayor, and said, we have a goal. By 2025, we wanna hire 1,000 black male educators. And the Philly mayor said, okay, let's do it. So the goal is to recruit, and not only recruit, but retain these black male educators in Philly, and the population, as you see, is predominantly black male students, and only 
only 4.56% of the teachers in Philly are black males. So it's 2% higher than the national trend, but it's still below what is needed to close the gap. So these are the young brothers right here. Um, Malachi um, Sharif, young brother right here, who is a principal at one of the charter schools in Philly, as well as brother Vincent. They have a lot of good stuff going in. There's a national, the second annual summit is coming up October 12th to the 14th, 2018 in Philly. You can go to their website and register. They're gonna be looking for speakers and more people to join this effort and so that we can ensure that we increase this model across the country. So why should we care about black teachers? We talk about data all the time, but why, why does it matter to us, right? Well, let's look at some studies. In 2008 study by London School of Economics found that white teachers graded black and Latino students more harshly for the same performance, counting as much as a 22% achievement gap. Think about that. If I'm a white teacher, I'm gonna lower the grades for a young black student. And then you end up referred to special ed. Johns Hopkins research has found that black teachers are much more likely than white teachers to think a black student will graduate from high school or get a college degree, especially if the kid's a black boy. Makes sense. They see you, they look like you, and you're gonna make it, man. No matter what's going on at home, you're gonna make it. At first, you don't think they're listening. They listen to everything people say. That's something about young people. They know everything you said on your best day, worst day, whatever. Because there's things to teach students that come back to me. They say, remember when you said that in class? I said, I don't remember. What, what did I say? He's like, yeah. I'm over doing that now in Morehouse. I said, oh, you're at Morehouse. Okay, and just these are the things that they believe, and you don't even remember. And sometimes they'll call you out, Mr. P, remember that day you flipped up on us? I said, yeah, I was mad at y'all. Y'all got my nerves that day, you know. But they remember those moments, and they say thank you because they know you care about them and call them out on their nonsense. Vanderbilt did another study, showed that black students are about as half as likely as white students to be put on gifted tracks, even when they have com comparable test scores. But the disparity was erased when black students were evaluated with black teachers. This is important. So the, uh, Ro uh, Roland Park, and those schools that had those gifted programs, the number of black students in those programs is very low. But they say if you change the number of black educators, you can increase the number of gifted and talented students in those programs versus special ed. What's the next one? This is a big topic we gotta talk about. Race and discipline. You know, we all see these movies and stuff, but the reality is, Black students will be suspended and expelled at a higher rate than any other group there is. At one time, it was black male students being suspended at higher rates. Now, most recently, the last two years, black girls now are being suspended at a much higher rate than any other group in the district. What are some initial thoughts of hearing that? Probably all old black girl attitudes. Um, <laughs> if, you have a, if you don't have the cultural relevance, you don't see it as being a queen like we do. You see it as a barrier or a challenge to you or a threat, when really it's just us being great. Um, <laughs> and when you have a black person dealing with that child, they understand that and they can teach them what Mark was talking about, cold switching, like, look, I know that's how you do, but if you want to get over it, it's not, it's not, they're not with that. Like, no, we're not doing that right now, you know? Right. But sometimes I know my um, white counterpart teachers tell me that there are things that I can say to my students that they can't say. Because the first thing our kids want to say is, you racist, don't say that to me. But when I say it to them, they're like, all right, Ms. Brown, all right, Ms. Brown. <laughs> right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Are black women the most educated demographic yes. in the United States? Yes. That might be part of the reason why they are disciplining black girls to slow that trend down, mm. to mitigate that trend. Because um, that's a good thing for us, but a bad thing for them. 
You got a sister right there, they want to go up to you in the back. And then if I miss any guys. And to piggyback what you guys were saying about attitude, um, that's correct. Especially, um, I remember this one time um, in high school. I attended Western High School. I graduated from there. And I failed in the entire first quarter. Um, what was it? I think it was biology. Because the teacher said I looked like I didn't want to be in her class. And at the time, like I didn't take it to my mom because um, she was a single parent, raising six children, and I'm like, she already got enough stress. So, you know, I kind of handled it on my own. We used to say I did graduate, but it is definitely about that attitude, but it's needed. You know, like you said, this that's kind of like our survival tech, you know, mechanism. So definitely with the attitude. We'll go to the sister right there, and then we'll go over here, and then we'll go to him. So him, him. Attitude does play a part. I am the complete opposite aspect. Um, I was coming into high school and post secondary, and then going out to the workforce. I actually, when it comes to being in it, I was taught to code switch early. I was taught to code switch early. I was taught as far as um, faking it till you make it for that much. That's what my mother taught me as far as being professional, having the tone, being non confrontational in the workspace. Right. So that being what was ingrained, I was in serious issues as far as dealing with my white counterparts where I was being baited regular. It was expected. They desired it. And being able to see, you know, just to, to go over it, like reach over that and be past that, it astounded them at times because I knew, that's when I knew that it was deliberate. Uh, we put in situations where, you know, things were being counterproductive, um, dealing with conflict or dealing with those aspects. You know, I would handle the confrontation but in a very passive aggressive way. And so basically me being able to match the passive aggression, they weren't expecting that it expected me to not have patience not have self-control, to have those things not happen. It was expected because that was a stereotype that was being put out. So to see me it was outside of what they were used to. And it was very uncomfortable and astounding for them. Let's go to him, then we'll go to you, Jamal. Yeah, I think the other dynamic is that uh, in an ideal world, I wish educators could stand back and watch a day in the life of a child. From the moment they get up, walking out the door, what happens to the sisters in this neighborhood, from elementary forward, the gauntlet that they have to go through with the brothers, unfathomable, unacceptable. It's heinous. Then they have to walk in the door. And then someone says, whether it could be a female or a male, but most of the females who go through this incredible gauntlet, why you got an attitude? I don't know. Let's see. Uh, last night I didn't get any sleep. The food, minimal. Maybe mom and dad were great, but the neighbors had the stereo on all night. Maybe mom and dad had me sleep in the tub because the bullets from the outside, they pierce the outside wall, I have to sleep in the tub. Then I have to come to school. Oh, guess what? Today's test day. Right. So somehow, I had to walk through the gauntlet with the guys who were trying to get in my skirt come into school and be focused, it's not possible, right? It's not possible. And then on the other side of that, we are asking, there are no more children. I don't think there are any more children, right? And they deserve a childhood, which is really complex. Because in order to get from Gilmore Homes or wherever they may walk from, we are expecting them, whether they are 9, 10, 12, to be adult-like. Mm. And then they come in school. And then the teacher says, I'm sorry, but you know, you're nine. You're not, you're not grown. But in many ways, we have expected them to be grown. So now you're expecting them to deconstruct all the things they heard from mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and everybody else, be in a classroom and accept that. That is extraordinarily difficult for any superhuman being. It is impossible for a child, especially if we think about brain development. Yep where they are in their maturation, the whole study of social emotional learning, which then requires the teacher to be super attuned to all that, but it also requires every single person in the building, from the person at the front desk. Fortunately, in this building, we have amazing guys. The brother sitting behind me, Lamont, the guy who opened the building, he gets it. But you've got to orchestrate that. And if you can't be in control of every variable, our girls, our boys, served up on 
what everyone has said, but the question was why were girls seemingly now more being more suspended um, in the schools? And so when I look back on my personal experience, me, I don't have any daughters, but I'm the oldest of five. And so when I was growing up being the oldest, I took on a lot of responsibility in the home. And so, like he said, without the male figure being there, having those responsibilities of four younger siblings, I would take them to school, I would bring them home. I started this at nine. Mm. And so, um, I know that with some of the comments that I've heard, I know that they are correct, because when you come to school, you're, you're on this mindset, like, to be able to have to switch that off and say I'm no longer secondary parent, but now I'm in school and now I'm just a little child and I'm just being told when to talk, when to sit, when to go to the bathroom, as opposed to me having four younger siblings who so now mom is going to work and now I have to tell you that. Also, in schools when, when the girls get suspended, what I notice is that it almost guarantees that the parents, will, the parents will show up, especially the mothers. When you go after the daughters, the mothers will show up. And so it becomes, this is a, a, a I, I would hate to say a strategy, because otherwise you would never see some of these parents in school. And so it's like these parents never show up. They don't come to any meetings. They don't come to any events. But when you go after the daughter and she's suspended, now mom has to take off from school. The daughter is not taking the siblings to school. And so it kind of disrupts everything that the mom has going on at home. So hopefully that's not the case, but that's just what I feel. From my lenses as a young black girl, um, I face a lot of racism and sexism, um, and that made me angry. And, um, you know, I perhaps didn't have to walk through any more projects. Um, I came from a two-parent household. Um, they were involved in school, right? Um, but sitting in the classroom, very few other students of color and virtually no black girls if I was perceived as smart, or if I um, would answer the question correctly, much to what you were talking about in the classroom, then, then it was deemed as an attitude, right? Or, you know, I wore my hair in ponytails and little braids and, you know, got teased on and picked on, and people wanted to touch my hair and see if my color would come off and stuff mm. like that. So facing those kind of challenges on a day-to-day -day basis will make you a little angry. Um, my mother would say, don't be aggressive, be assertive, right? But that was what she taught me. But I think about some other smart young girls who perhaps didn't have someone to say to them, it's not aggression, it's not anger, be assertive, be respectful, you know what I mean? Right. So, it happens on so many different levels that um, need to be addressed. So, Thanks. I find it's a little different. The research shows that the most common infraction for suspensions are, and it's not up there, but it is disrespect, insubordination, quote unquote, and fighting, right? Baltimore is just like everybody else in the ground of the country. The um, suspension rates for black male and female students are higher than their white peers.